Welcome to this edition of EMS Now Up Close. Uh, I'm Eric Miskell with EMS Now, and today it's my pleasure to speak with Andrew Williams. Andrew is the CEO of Libra Industries, and Libra's, as we're going to discover, is a North American-based EMS with a long history in the industry, as a matter of fact, and a uh, very interesting story. So, Andrew, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. It's I've been looking forward to this interview. Yeah, same same here, Eric. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Why don't you begin by introducing yourself? You have quite a history with the EMS industry yourself, even before Libra, and then maybe give us an overview of the company as well. Sure, be glad to. Yeah, I, I've got uh, a long history in in EMS. Tried a couple times to get out, like a lot of folks did, and was never successful in in uh, finding a, a path into another industry. But looking back, I'm. I'm actually glad that I didn't. Um, I took my first DMS job back in 1992. It uh, was a very small contract manufacturer um, up in the Huntsville, Alabama uh, market. Uh, wasn't uh, SCI at the time, but if some folks that had left SCI and started up this small place, believe it or not, we were building uh, cumulus PCs that were uh, being going into Sears. Sears was there their primary seller, and neither one of those companies are around any longer, Cumulus or Sears. But started my career there, uh, actually sitting on a manufacturing line, uh, doing through-hole for PCBs, and then moved, thought I got promoted, moved up into box build, and then eventually made my way to shipping. So it kind of started at the, the ground roots in the EMS world. Been fortunate over the 35 plus years to really have had a chance to, to travel the world, to to meet some some great people, to experience a lot of good cultures, and work for some great companies. I worked for uh, Jabel for about 13 years, which is where the majority of my career was. I had an opportunity to work for Kimball Electronics as well. Two of those companies I, I really consider kind of the the top in the industry. Spent some time over at Samina uh, and a few other stops along the way. I actually joined Libra. In the fall of 2020, uh, when I came in, I was the SVP of business development. And when I took that position, I had responsibility for all of our sales, marketing, uh, account management. I took over the estimating function at the time and we're doing all the contracts for the company. So I had a lot of uh, influence early on and kind of where the direction of the company was headed. And then fortunate enough to be get promoted to uh, the CEO in Q2 of last year. So I uh, just crossed over the, the one year uh, barrier and really enjoying my time here at Libra. A uh, little bit about Libra, as you mentioned, uh, we're a, a, a full, full suite manufacturing services company. Uh, it's really three companies that have come together as one. It's a pretty amazing story. Uh, Gem City uh, is the oldest piece of our, 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 of our uh, company, 85 years plus history of doing precision machining, high-end system integration, clean room build here in the Dayton, Ohio uh, area. I relocated to Dayton, Ohio uh, last year, so I'm, I'm officially one of the, uh, the folks here in the original Gem City. We coupled that with uh, Libra Industries, which is where we took our name. Uh, Libra uh, had operations, as you know, in the Cleveland uh, market and then uh, operations in Dallas. So those companies were primary electronics uh, manufacturing, which fit really nicely in with the, the primarily mechanical system type builds that we were doing here in Dayton. So those two came together and then we rounded out the footprint with an acquisition of a tier one uh, EMS uh, facility in Guaymas, Mexico, uh, which gives us that uh, near shore kind of offering uh, that we might talk about a little bit later on. But as a company, we're really focused on system integration. The majority of our revenue is in that upper end, very complex module assembly. And then we use our verticals to uh, pull through business and to support that integration business. And the markets we focus on really are semicon, defense, robotics, aero, medical, and then high-end Industrial, we're going to be in markets that are very highly complex, highly regulated type of markets, generally uh, higher mix, lower volume type business. So that's a little bit about me and about uh, Libra. 
Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you mentioning that that history with Gem City, because I know that that brought some really some strong and unique capabilities to, as you as you so well stated, uh, especially with the type of manufacturing you're doing with full system integration. It, it did. And and to be honest with you, I, I was just pleasantly surprised with uh, the capabilities that this factory has. You know, I've spent most of my career in tier one uh, manufacturing organizations, and I can tell you the complexity of the products that uh, our team builds day in and day out here rival or surpass any of those other companies I've worked with. We have a, a, a very strong um, uh, pool of talent here in Dayton, a lot of tool and die guys that grew up in machine shops. You know, they can uh, take a, a drawing and tell you before they even put their hands on it where the problems are going to be. So that type of skill and talent really helps us when we're uh, doing joint development with our customers and trying to bring products to, to market. Yeah. And I have to say, I did like uh, on your website, I have it up right here. You have that capabilities matrix for all your facilities. And I think that's a really good way to get a sense of both the capabilities, but also what's unique to each specific location within your footprint. Yeah, and we try to uh, look at that kind of from a redundancy um, standpoint as well, uh, business risk assurance standpoint. So when you're looking at it, you'll see a lot of commonalities between our factory in Cleveland and Dallas, and then you'll see a lot of commonalities between uh, our factory here in Dayton and in Guaymas. Dayton and Guaymas are more mechanical in nature, system integration in nature, and then when you see Dallas, they're going to be Dallas and Cleveland, they're going to be electronics build, smaller uh, format box build. Those plants do a great job of supporting each other, and it gives our customers lots of options in North America. Absolutely. Now, you also recently, I think a month or so ago, uh, completed the new clean room there in the Dayton facility, I guess, where you yes. are sitting currently. So tell me about kind of the high tech work that uh, will be done there. Yeah, it's an, a, a continued expansion off of one of our customers we have here in the Dayton facility is actually the largest customer uh, we have in the, the company today. So we doubled the size of our clean room on the back of a very substantial award that we received. So that work that goes on inside that clean room, we're bringing in um, large format machine components uh, from outside. So we do use some uh, external machining partners. Uh, we're doing a lot of high precision, ultra high precision machining of components just across the parking lot here where I'm sitting. All of those products uh, come into the clean room. Um, there's a lot of uh, fluid work that goes on there, a lot of cabling work that goes on there. And when you talk about the form factor, these things weigh thousands of pounds and you know they may be five feet long by uh, three feet high by four feet deep. So these aren't small you know, desktop type of appliances that we're, um, uh, that we're manufacturing. We have to have two ton cranes overhead to be able to support it. So very complex, high end work. And it's a result of the team here performing over the last 85 years that have got us into the position where we can continue to grow. Okay. And I notice also that you have the, uh, the new COO there, uh, Bob Herman has just announced and recently joined you. Tell me, what, what does Bob bring to the team? Yeah, we're so excited to have to have Bob here. He, he actually joined back in January, February timeframe. We were just a little behind on, on getting that uh, press release out. But really, um, you know, I talked about that we were a combination or a compilation of, of three companies, being Gem City, Libra, and um, the factory we bought in Mexico from a, from a tier one, right? So, you know, the, the story, you try as hard as you can to integrate those facilities and create commonality on processes where it makes sense, but it's tough, right? Especially uh, thinking back to the time when we were trying to do that integration, which was right in the middle of COVID and all the supply chain issues we had, inability to travel into those facilities. So really when we were looking to fill Bob's role, we were looking for someone that had a very strong uh, lean background, a very strong continuous improvement background, and a very strong standardization background. So his mission right now, in addition to launching all the new projects that we're winning, is to really work on standardizing our operations across the company. So when a customer walks from one site to another, you know, it looks and feels the same and operates the same. Okay, excellent. Um, 
there are a lot of EMS companies in the industry, right? A lot here in North America. What what do you consider to be Libra's kind of differentiator? What what do you do best? Yeah, we 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 actually move away from the EMS um, terminology a little bit. I know it's still standard for us, but the majority of our revenue is not in electronics. The majority of our revenue is in machining and metal fab and that system integration. So, but we do still have a very strong and capable electronics business as well. Uh, when I look at us, what I really think uh, where we differentiate ourselves is we've got uh, a lot of vertical capabilities and we've got a lot of tools in our supply chain organization and our quality organization in our engineering organization that rival, you know, those tier ones that I've worked at in the past. But we do it in a much smaller scale, much more nimble, much more intimate approach. So just the relationships that we build with our customers, and we're very selective about, uh, you know, where we're going to engage and where we're not going to engage, just as our customers are with us. But once we engage with the customer, we're committed, you know, we dedicate a team to them. We're going to work with them to understand product roadmaps and what their needs are and service them just like they would get out of a tier one at a very smaller scale. Okay, good. Now, the MS industry has always been faced with a lot of different challenges. And the most common one in recent years have really been kind of that that material. It went from shortages to material overhead. Right, right. right. Yeah. And then also kind of the workforce and labor availability. Speak to those and how are those currently impacting your business? I'll, I'll speak to them. And at the same time, I'll, I'll knock on wood, hoping that those never come back around because I've, I've been here 35 years and that was one of the, the most challenging environments we ever, we ever went through. I, I'm very proud of how our supply chain organization managed ourselves through that. Uh, you know, we did everything we could to get parts for our, our customers so that they could continue to, to provide uh, product to their end customers. But then they had a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that we covered ourselves from a PPV standpoint and we didn't come out of the back end bloated with inventory. So we actually performed quite well. We track ourselves from a days and in inventory standpoint against all of the publicly reported companies. And we outperformed all of those guys coming out of COVID. Uh, and still, you know, had really good uh, customer satisfaction. So hope we never get back there. The market on the electronics is a lot, lot better than it was, you know, a couple of years ago. So we still have the occasional issue that pops up, but nothing like it was then. The labor side is is uh, gotten a lot better as well. Um, it's still, you know, it's not 1980s, 1990s type of labor availability. We still have to plan uh, really well around you know, our growth and new programs coming in and make sure that we've got a good understanding of what talent we're going to need and, and try to get a little creative on how we go out and recruit it. So that uh, continues to be a, a focus for us. But but for us, we, we're focusing on the, the future and the growth. We're, we're on a path to be a $500 million company in the next few years here. And, you know, I've seen that um, story before. I've been involved with it in a couple of customers or a couple of companies that I worked with in the past, and you have to have just solid talent. So we focus really hard right now on organizational design and organizational development, mm -hmm. actually leveraging one of your friends, uh, Audrey McGuckin and the McGuckin Group, right? They've been working with us hand in hand, both on strategy and just helping us get our strategy on paper and facilitating that process. And now we're doing a lot of work in the human development side, trying to make sure that one and two levels down in our organization, we've got the leadership skills and the talent that's going to be required to get us to 500 million. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, one of the, the, the balancing acts, I guess it is in the industry is that the, the human versus the automation, right? And, and different yep. companies, depending on who they are, value different sides of that. It sounds like for you, so how do you view that and how do you, it seems like you give more to the human side, but automation yet is still critical to being competitive in the industry. It, it, it is. And um, um, it's an interesting uh, kind of question and it's very interesting to look at. Our business tends to be more higher mix, lower volume, <clears throat> which doesn't necessarily lend itself to uh, automation in the manufacturing process. The one exception I would draw would be where you need a, a high degree of repeatability, right? Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of uh, welding, as an example, of large frames and large cabinets in our factory in Guaymas. 
and there's a lot of repeatability that's required there. So we're investing in automation in that process just to make sure from a quality standpoint that we're delivering what we need. The other area that we focus a lot of automation on is kind of in the, um, the uh, side of our business where we have a lot of transactions, whether it's supply chain or planning or you know, intercompany sales or, or whatever. There's a lot of waste that occurs there with cutting POs and chasing down confirmations and expediting, et cetera. So we're looking and investing in a lot of tool sets to help us automate that side of the business as well. But generally speaking, you know, our business is, is still going to be uh, highly skilled laborers um, working to create some very complex products, and we'll continue to focus on developing that skill first. Okay. Well, are there any other, I'm just thinking about your business, is there other, other types of challenges in the current environment? I'm thinking, are, are tariffs uh, having any impact on you with, with what's happening there? Or? Uh, not, not so much the tariffs. You know, most of our electronics, we buy them through distribution here in the, the U.S., so we don't get exposed to the tariffs directly. Uh, we do get tariff charges from those guys, and again, our supply chain group does a very good job of trying to uh, factor that into our quotes and our PM group does a good job of managing that mm -hmm. uh, with our customers. So we don't get impacted as much by tariffs. Last year and the year before, you know, we, we faced some challenges in Mexico, both with the, the cost of uh, labor increases, both on the DL and the IL side, and a lot of that being gover government mandated. So we weren't able to pass all of that back along to our customers. We had to work hard to try to put efficiencies or drive efficiencies to offset some of that cost. And then we did work with our customers to try to recover some of it. So hopefully that'll, um, that'll tamper down a little bit. We also were in, influenced quite a bit by uh, currency swings with the peso, right? So we're trying to become a little smarter about how we deal with peso uh, spend, especially as our business in Mexico continues to grow. Okay, excellent. And I wanted to touch on the, your Mexico facility in, in a bit, because I mean, one of the trends in this industry that's been driving growth in North America has obviously been reshoring, nearshoring, whatever you want to call it, right? I have a colleague who calls it exshoring because mm -hmm. it, it incorporates all of it. You have that facility in Mexico. What are you seeing in that regard? Yeah. So that facility, if I just take a minute and talk to you about it, we doubled the size of that footprint over the last 18 months. And we invested significantly in terms of capability in our metal fabrication and the machining areas. Um, and we added powder coat, which is the first time as a company we've had a powder coat capability. We did that because we were seeing early on um, a desire of the OEMs, at least in the markets that we participate in, to leverage Mexico more and more, right? So that's paying off for us now. You know, the first uh, couple of quarters, it was it was hard uh, sitting there having that capacity available and not seeing business flowing through the plants. And there was a little bit of uh, reset with some of our customers, but we're seeing just a tremendous amount of interest in, in Mexico in general. And we are starting to see customers coming back from Southeast Asia. One of the biggest opportunities we're pursuing right now is a resource from Southeast Asia. And it's absolutely going to going to hit. Hopefully it hits with us, but it's coming back. So for a couple of years, you heard a lot about reshoring and people were talking about it and you never really saw it turning into tangible uh, activity, but we're starting to see more and more of that today. Yeah, good. And the other issue that, that's big is the whole sustainability issue, right? And, and I hear that a lot of that's government driven, kind of regulation driven initially, but EMS industry is adopting it and, and adapting to it. How do you view that? How's it impacting you? Yeah, so we keep an eye on sustainability. Um, and, you know, to be fair, a lot of that's driven by our customers, right? We're dealing with uh, the bluest of blue chips and a lot of them are much more advanced than we are from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, but we keep a, a, a keen eye there. We go through a lot of audits with our customers. Uh, we want to be sustainable as well as a company and we want to be sustainable and a good partner uh, to the to the local economy and to the environment in general. So I see the the focus on that from our customers increasing, and I see a lot of uh, interest in terms of our employees wanting to support that type of activity as well. Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. Now you've mentioned customers a few times there, so I'd like to kind of <laughs> you know pick on that. It's it's such an important element to everything that that you do. Um, 
Are OEMs, are you notice, are they outsourcing more? Are you, are the relationship changing in any way? Yeah. Um, before we go there, I'll tell you that uh, I talk a lot about customers because the first three quarters of my career was always customer facing uh, roles, right? Whether it was sales or account management or sector management. And, and I just enjoy um, servicing our customers and creating solutions for them. And I'm glad you heard that multiple times because here in the company, that's what we want people to think in every decision we're thinking about. Is it good for the customer? Is it good for the company as well, right? But specific to your question, it, you know, it's it's not slowing down the outsourcing. It's 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 here to stay. There's dynamics that uh, that are driving growth in some areas, like in our our medical business. There's the aging uh, workforce, and some of us that don't treat our bodies as well as we should. Maybe when we were younger, that it's catching up with us now. So that drives a little bit of uh, a growth for us, and then. You know, we're pretty heavily concentrated in the defense and the robotics industry. And right now, with the way the geopolitics are, that's driving some growth. And then, you know, our largest sector is uh, Semicon or Semicon CapEx, right? And when you look around us, you can't uh, look anywhere um, today without seeing electronics and just the proliferation of that content and AI. And, you know, it's just wide open. So, I think customers are continuing to uh, be committed to the outsource model. I think that uh, when they're comfortable with you as a partner and your uh, capabilities and they're convinced that you've got their best interest in, in mind, you're going to see more than your fair share of opportunities. And that's what we're benefiting from right now. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking there is that stickiness of the relationship, as it's referred to, right? If you serve them well, they tend to be loyal and stay, and it's hard to it's hard to move that relationship to another competitor. That's right, and you got to be careful. And you know, the stickiness is is great because you're not constantly worrying about you know losing the business over a couple pennies, but you can't become complacent either. You've always got to be looking to try to take waste out of the business and take cost out of the business, not your margin. Everybody needs to make a, a fair margin, but you can't become complacent because you'll, you'll eventually look up and those customers will be leaving. So we stay very heavily focused on uh, our customer metrics, our on-time delivery, our quality. We, we really push for QBRs with all of our customers and also executive level relationships just to make sure we're doing what we need to do. Yeah, good for you. So. It's been kind of a relatively tough year overall for the EMS industry so far, right? I mean, in, in, in the first half of the year, revenues are down and you can see that with the distributor sales being down. Um, what's your opinion on the industry moving forward? The rest of, I mean, we're in almost into third, fourth quarter here, right? Last month of the third quarter and f f this year and next year, how are you viewing that? Uh, what's your opinion? We're, we're in a little bit of a unique situation. Um, we will see about 30, 35% growth this year because um, we had some significant awards that we were fortunate to win in late uh, 23 that are ramping and coming through this year. A lot of it on the back of that, that clean room business. Um, so, and we've got a lot of um, runway in front of us that we've got to, to onboard a lot of uh, new awards as well. So over the next 18 months, we'll double in size of a business, but that's really with existing customers, right? So that's us doing a good job with our existing customers and building trust with them and then giving us more opportunities to, you know, to eat at the table, right? Mm -hmm. What I see in, in some parts of our business are a little bit of softening, you know, maybe, you know, 10, 15% in the first half of the year, um, with kind of our traditional EMS business, but that was all offset by this additional new awards that we, we've got coming through. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that that kind of uh, levels off. And by the time we get all of this onboarding done late this year, early next year, the market will be hot and we can go back out and double again. Yeah, that's excellent. You know, I had a colleague tell me recently, uh, old EMS guy, um, not that you're an old EMS guy. I am. That's <laughs> that wasn't the implication. But that that EMS on average, you know, one good significant relationship per year adding is 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 generally a good trend for them. Yeah. And it sounds like that you're outpacing that. Well, we, we, we target bringing on maybe two to three new relationships or new logos each year. 
but we put equal emphasis on growing our existing business, right? Because uh, people know the easiest way to, to grow your business is to perform with your current customers. As long as they got additional market, you know, you get a shot at that. So we're, we're very selective. We're not out pursuing, you know, 10 or 15 different customers. We know that there's a big investment uh, to onboard a customer. Uh, there's a lot of trust that the customer's placing us when we're onboarding them. So we're not going to stretch ourselves too thin. We're going to go after two to three significant new uh, relationships each year and work as hard as we can to be successful with those. Excellent. Um, before I let you go, I have to ask, is there anything about Libra Industries that I haven't asked you about that you would like to share with our audience? I, you, you did a pretty good job of, of covering things, but what, what I will tell you, and uh, in a recent, uh, when we did our grand opening, our ribbon cutting of the clean room here, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I actually got a little bit um, emotional when I started talking about the, the team that we have here in Libra, right? So uh, I talk a lot about 85, 90 years worth of history here in Gem City, but we got over 40 years worth of history building PCBAs in Cleveland and Dallas. And the factory there in Mexico has got a long history as well, if you trace it all the way back to its roots. So when you look at the, the team that we have as a company, I, I'm blessed to have an opportunity to, to be in this position to lead them. And I'm blessed uh, to have that strength uh, that they're providing to our customers. So the only thing I would encourage you to do when you get a chance, come visit us. You can see firsthand uh, our factories. You can meet our, our team firsthand and, and you'll know what I'm talking about when you have a chance to do that. Excellent. I will take you up on that and invite uh, anybody watching this to reach out to, to to avail themselves of that opportunity. Again, I would tell people too the capabilities matrix on on your website I find excellent and uh, it gives a really good overview of of what you guys do and encourage people to take a look at that. So well, well thank you. Yeah, we're we're open. I I'm, I'm pretty active on on LinkedIn, so if anybody wants to to ping me there you can or you can always reach us through through our website. If you're looking for somewhere to visit in the middle of the uh, winter, our Guaymas facility is about five miles from San Carlos. So we tend to get a lot of visitors that time of the year down there. I, I will give one warning though. There is another Andrew Williams in the industry. So make sure you're catching the one from Libra Industries when you do that. Uh, that or you, yep. With another yep. colleague of mine and I've accidentally sent emails to the wrong one before. So, <laughs> so <laughs> be warned. Um, Andrew, thank you very much for your time today. This has been excellent. I've really enjoyed learning more about Libra. I've known a little bit about you in the history, but this is certainly enhances my understanding. And uh, anytime you'd like to come back on and talk some more, I invite you to. Well, thank you, Eric. And I, I, I appreciate what you guys do uh, with these, these uh, casts as well. I, I watch a lot of them and I enjoy um, the interaction you have with with the other companies. And I just think it's good for all of us. So appreciate you doing it. Absolutely, sir. We'll keep doing it. Uh, take good care. Thank you very much. Thank you.